Here we go. Has he done it? Good afternoon, everybody. AD here. Um, I'm here with uh, sports scientist Dr. Luke Mosley. Morning, I'm, just waiting for, I'm waiting for confirmation as ever, looking down in my group on the Facebook page to see if anything's happening. Um, yep, I'm there. We're there, Moat. We are there. We are there. Nice. So um, we'll, we'll wait a couple of minutes just to see if anybody engages. <coughs> We're also recording this um, um, for our YouTube channel, Mr. Moat. Is that okay? course that's great okay um so um how have you been filling your time luke are you you um you, you're a teacher aren't you? a bit, bit of chat before we get started from you're, you're yeah, a teacher yeah, so we're working from home yeah so working from home i'm uh, a part-time got my own coaching business uh two days a week and then i teach uh, at a local sixth form college three days a week so um like everybody the the lockdown was a it was a real shock especially for, for teachers and students who one day were coming to college like normal the next day everyone was home just like that so uh, for everybody teachers and students adapting to sort of working online has been a rush like it has been for everybody um so getting through some teething technical stuff but yeah i'm good i'm home i've set up a little office in the spare room i've got my webcam um so and i'm enjoying the teaching and and great to have be have contact with the athletes as well so in the coaching business it's been good to hear how everyone's been getting on with the the current disruption shall we say it's current disruptions very positive spin on things okay cool so um mr mosley luke first of all um now we've known each other for i think about eight or nine years now since we since we started our first gym of rotherus and i think we met i think it's first of all the climb on bikes open day or something like yeah. that where yeah, i did a little right. presentation there wasn't it okay yeah. um so um luke tell us a bit about your background and um your from an educational point of view how you got into science but also as a a fairly reasonable standard athlete in your own right as well tell me more tell me yeah. more yes yeah, so so i'm now in my early 40s which makes me feel makes me <laughs> makes me feel much older than i than i think i am but um, so my background is I did a degree in sports science. I did a PhD in sports science, but I was always uh, an endurance athlete as a kid. I absolutely loved sport as a kid. I played everything. I was in every team. I was rubbish at most of them, um, but I just enjoyed participating. Um, I ended up, I sort of drifted into cycling and that sort of passion for endurance sports got me into sports science. Um, and I was always a bit of an academic geek at school. I always liked, you know, that sort of thing, like the numbers. Um, so after doing my degree and my PhD, I lectured for a bit in sports science. And then realized that what I really enjoyed was sort of engaging with students uh, and then slightly randomly drifted into being a maths teacher, which is which is what I do three days a week. And then I also run uh, because, I, you know, even when I took a break from lecturing, even when I moved careers, the sports science was always something that I found fascinating. Um, I had coaching experience from doing my degree, etc. Uh, so I just kept it going, started a small company um, coaching athletes at a distance in endurance sport, mainly triathlon and cycling, uh, which has been fantastic. And then that's obviously also fed into my own sport. I've continued to be an endurance athlete, uh, cycling, running, triathlon, all that sort of stuff. Uh, if it involves going for longer than half an hour, I'm interested in it. Shorter than half an hour, it's going to be far too fast for me, I think. So when um, when myself and Luke first met, uh, first met, it was, um, you know, he likes numbers and doing sports, which consider uh, anything longer than half an hour. And it just seemed we're interested in polar opposite things. Um, myself from a more of a rugby background and team sport background and uh, and not particularly um, hot on the mathematical side of things so no, but it's a, it's a friendship which has lasted the test of time so luke was um luke was um we luke um hired myself first of all then um and then we got the what bikes so, and luke was um really behind um putting the cycling improvement program together which we've running for seven years now which is uh, still a great program so and the thing what we we try and do um, in the business is everything is done with a bit of science behind it. So it just it makes sense um, from a physiological and biomechanical standpoint. So, Luke, tell us a bit about the cycling improvement program, about how, how you know, your your your, your favourite saying, which I've probably stolen, is, um, you know, structure and consistency. It's not even a saying, but structure and consistency is what gets results, isn't it? So tell us a bit about the cycling improvement program and how what were the foundations on that? Because these, a lot of our guys have done the uh, the first phase, the first program before Christmas, building a good aerobic and base threshold, and then they've gone into zone four and zone five work. So, um, and then and then this happens. So, um, what I want to get onto in a little bit is about how we can kind of um, maximize the time we've got available to still 
get the benefits or certainly not let any fitness dissipate. But tell us a bit about the cycling improvement program and, and the structure behind it, if you don't mind. Course, yeah, so obviously I came to, as you as you mentioned, I we first got to know each other when I asked you to help me with some running injuries I was having when I was ultra running, and then you got the the what bikes and we started talking about that. Um, I've been involved in using power um, since I was in the lab, which would have been in 1998, and we had the, some of the very first SRM power cranks. And in those days, they were big and they were heavy and they were wired, and you know they were generating numbers, and we had to learn to to understand them. Um, and if we think how far we've come, and I've come in terms of using power. It was about eight years ago that you got those watt bikes. And at that time, if you know, if I chatted to an athlete and I talked about functional threshold power, I talked about zone three, zone four, zone five, sweet spot, um, that sort of thing. Or if I even talked about wattages, people really didn't have a clue, you know. And, and, and it's so interesting and, and, and exciting now that if you chat to really just your everyday um, recreational cyclists, the idea of power and watts really hits home. People know what 200 watts is. You know, five, six years ago when I was giving talks um, at your place, 300 watts was just a number. People really didn't know what it was. So people have come a massive, massive way. And I think anybody doing the cycling improvement program probably isn't aware of how much they've learned through doing it. Um, and when you and I sat down to structure it, we talked about both creating something that was structured, consistent, progressive, but also educational. So yeah, people yeah, learn to sort of use their power, understand that pacing and what those numbers meant. Uh, and back then when we started it, people didn't really have power meters on their bikes, but now they, they have and they can transfer those numbers over. Um, yeah. In terms of what my thoughts were behind the cycling improvement program, um, I really, for that first set, I, I funneled in a progression that I've been doing myself. You know, I was racing a lot then on my bike um, and I funneled in a sort of 12 week program that I'd been using to, to sort of develop my base fitness, having had a layoff of the bike while I was running with that injury. Um, and so really what I'm looking for as a coach, and I know what we talked about is exactly as you say, Structure and consistency. I mean, consistency is thing. Consistency beats everything. But if you can have consistency and structure together, and then you mix that mix that up with a little bit of progression, and the progression is there as much to keep it interesting as to, as to do anything else, um, and that's that's so important. And I think the last thing that's that I think the cycling improvement does well, and that powers helped us do well, and, and the general person in the street understand is that idea of baseline testing. You know, and that works so well with the cycling improvement program. Yes, it is the most savage session you will do. Yes, it's tortuous. Um, yes, you have to be quite an experienced or, or committed cyclist to do it. But if you can get that baseline, set your zones from that baseline, work your consistency and your progression from there, it works. You know, and I'm sure you've seen the, the results that have come through. Right. And what, what we love about it is some people get the experience and, and maybe... Um, how can I say, get the confidence to go out on their own? On you know, from anybody from starting off on a bike, we've got some guys who I hope are listening today who haven't been out on a bike for 20, 30 years. They they get the, the confidence in their fitness first, then the confidence to to then go out on the bike, and and that's what I, I love seeing. Um, and, and it's also using the um, how can I say, using the bike as a kind of measurement tool of, of even somebody's own well-being, yet alone fitness, so that yeah. educating them that. If, if you reach a certain level, you might not be able to reach it every day. You know, the fact that, you know, you can you can use it to learn about your own body and get the feedback about your own fitness, which is, um, I think, even relating it to where we are today in the um, <clears throat> what's going on outside the stressful situation and the effects of stress on, on exercise performance and things like that is that, you know, if people have got a lot on, they're not going to be able to maintain that top level. And I think in the early days, we have a couple of, a couple of individuals who came to us who, couldn't quite understand that the the machine that what the fixed reliable piece of equipment the human body it is not so reliable um day in day out yeah. in hitting yeah. certain benchmarks and certain yeah. things if you get yourself to a great level um you know you need to listen to your body and, and i think that's what the watt bikes also be useful for and i think i think that's where the idea of training zones is so important you know we're so used we're, we're a measure we're a measured species now you know google's measuring exactly where i am all the time most people a lot of people wear fitness trackers which we can have a conversation about another day, but you know, we're a middle society and people are so saying, hang on, I did 300 watts last time. I'm not, I'm doing 295 this time. What's the crack? But it's that idea of training zones. You know, training zones are there so that we can say zone four and anywhere in zone four is, is fine. If you feel good, do you know what? Push on. If you don't feel good, do you know what? The bottom of zone five, four is absolutely fine. You know, yeah. splitting hairs between a what doesn't matter. No. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay, you know, and, and as you know, with my um, 
my own. So just so you guys know, I, I do a bit of cycling now and things. I've done a few kind of events. Not, not, I'm not going to break the land speed records, but um, um, it's probably Luke who's Luke who is to blame for for getting me out on the bike. I haven't been cycling since I went mountain biking in the night, late eighties until until Luke came along and told me I should be getting out and doing it myself. But I know from my own sleep habit how detrimental poor sleep is to being able to perform. You know, if if I get myself into a reasonable state of fitness and then if, if I'm lacking sleep, you know, I can be down 15, 20% easily, you know, and, and, and I see people coming in who are visibly tired um, and who are trying to hold themselves to that kind of level. And that's my kind of, um, my, my constant thing. When I see the data is great, the watts are great, but that's my one thing all the time is just, Ask yourself how you're feeling before you get on the bike, you know? Ask yourself how you're feeling before you have your first double espresso. And I think our society... <laughs> you know, Just we, a month. Mask, we mask fatigue with caffeine, you know, and, and, and that it's socially acceptable to do that. <laughs> I know you understand that. <laughs> but we, need to, we need to be aware that that's fine because we've got to get up and do stuff. You know, we've got to get up and the kids have been awake and we've got that deadline and we've got these things to do and there's that social... That's all fine. But but there's times when if you try and mask that fatigue with caffeine, then you just dig yourself in a hole. You know, you will. And so it's being honest with yourself as well. I, I could well be talking to you. How do you watch? But <laughs> I just just think of most I'm 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 I mean, this is my third day consecutive. I haven't been to the gym. I'm working from home, trying to get a bit of downtime. And I haven't had a coffee for three days. And yeah, I know. Mate, I know. And this morning, about half ten, I was I was so in need. I was so in need. Well, I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed. Yeah, exactly. As I, as I shake and talk at the same time. So, folks, let's get on to it. Um, we got this uh, period of time where we're really not sure what's um, going on. We've got a description of exercise time, which I was quite impressed. Made a point of that, to be honest with you. Um, how best do we use it? How do we maintain our, you know, if, if we are no, semi-serious and we just want to maximise this time, what should our kind of week look like? What should we be doing? I think uh, uh, so. There's a couple of a couple of things. Can you relate this to like cyclists and runners, you know. That, of so the first thing, thing I'd say is, is what I've been saying to my athletes, and obviously I've been reaching out to all my athletes this week and, and making sure that we've got good sort of um, channels of communication, how, know how they're doing, etc. Obviously, everyone's got quite stressful times at the moment. So the first thing that I say is, do you know what? Look after your head. Uh, and, and physical activity is a way to look after your head. So if you're not sure about what session to do and you're worrying about that, just get out the door. Just get yeah. out the door. Um, training inside is fantastic. Training, uh, structured training is fantastic. You know, but I'll come back to what's important and consistency is king or queen. And, uh, and that matters. So number one, get out the door, blow the cobwebs away, take a deep breath and just enjoy being around. Uh, and do you know what? The roads are quiet at the moment. People aren't driving, obviously. <laughs> You know, the government has said you need to get out for your normal mode of exercise. So if, you know, if you're feeling a bit cooped up, just get out. So the first thing is look after your brain and your, and your mental health. The second thing then is, is what can we do to hang on to those gains? Now, uh, people are interpreting, you know, the sort of the, the sort of lockdown rules in terms of exercise in different ways. Some people feel comfortable to go out for long bike rides. Other people don't feel comfortable. And that's absolutely fine. You know, there's a whole range of ways to interpret that. Um, I would say if we if we looked at sort of an hour of training a day, which is what a lot of people are tending to do, um, I wouldn't overcomplicate it. I'd alternate easier days and harder days. Um, I'd have an easier day where I just went out for a spin and I focused on switching my music off, switching my podcasts off, listening to the quiet, so to speak, and taking deep breaths. Even though at times it can be a little bit boring, actually what you're doing is you're getting gentle exercise, zone two type exercise, and you're refreshing yourself ready for the hard work. Yeah. And then on the other days. Um, I'd do some intensity, you know, and I'd, and I'd alternate within the alternate, if you see what I mean. So day one, go out for an hour easy. Day two, maybe do short, hard intervals, find a hill, find a bit of straight road, push on for between two, three, four minutes, and then recover for the same amount. So your work and your rest are about the same in terms of duration, and maybe do three or four of those. And you want to be working in those to the point where it's a bit uncomfortable. You'd rather slow down, but you're able to keep going. Um, so that would be the first hard session of your four days. And then on the fourth day, push yourself for a little bit longer, push for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Obviously, that's going to have to be slightly less hard than the shorter ones. But again, just so you feel like you're making progress through the world, feel like your heart and your lungs are working. And between those four bike rides on a four day cycle, 
that's enough. Now we can get loads more structured. Um, I can post up links and I've got links ready to post up in the chat um, within this this WebEx and then maybe we can add, post them to the Facebook thing as well um, of different um, online training platforms. Obviously they're going mad at the moment. You've got Zwift, Trainer Road, Sufferfest. They're all doing, you know, uh, free, cheap offers to get online and different stuff like that. Yeah. Whatever floats your boat for the mojo, um, but be consistent, alternate hard and easy days. Those are my two core messages. Yeah, and I, I think for, from, from my point of view, with our, uh, not, not all clients, but um, people see this as an opportunity. And I, I love the fact that people do see this as an opportunity to improve their fitness. The, uh, the one thing I urge is that people don't go too hard because from an immune system point of view, <laughs> not being funny, yeah. we don't want to be pushing ourselves unnecessarily hard at this moment in time. It doesn't seem to make any right. sense. What I'm doing, what I'm doing now uh, is I'm linking. I'm going to post a, uh, a little link into um, an article that my old PhD supervisor um, put up. Um, he's a, a Professor Asker Jukendrup. He's a Dutch guy. He's now a sports science consultant, and he, he currently works. If, if, if this all goes wrong now post straight into the Facebook group. So okay. um, um and he's he's done a really good post, really, really straightforward and easy to understand what you can eat and do to reduce become your likelihood of becoming infected with respiratory pathogens, i.e. protecting your immune system. And I think you're absolutely right. Some people are attempted to go out there and completely beat the arse out of some monster rides and monster sessions. This is not a time to be negatively affecting your immune system. It's a time to be getting a little bit fitter gradually. Um, and the things that really hit home, obviously, I've, I've read through it uh, and, and, you know, it struck a lot of sort of um, memory bells with me are sleep, good sleep, healthy food, fresh food, yeah. not training in a carbohydrate depleted state. So these aren't the times to go out and be doing fasted rides or bonking. Um, you want to be having your carbohydrates on your endurance rides. Um, and then potentially um, things like nutritional supplements, vitamin D is quite useful, uh, and probiotics. Um, so, you know, your live yogurts and your kefirs and stuff like that. Those are those are the things that run home with me, I'm sure. Um, if individuals read it, different things will resonate with them. But they're not. I think what I'd say is you don't have to have every piece in that jigsaw to be perfect. We can all make one little change. Might be one little bit more sleep or making sure we take that extra gel on our bike ride so that we don't bonk. And those little things. Can be the crucial thing between getting ill and not getting ill yeah absolutely absolutely i think it's great advice um we've got um a question i believe in office of coach dixon james um saying hi guys I, I have a friend who is considering going out what might be the best way to get started they train regularly but not much in the way of cardio hmm. <laughs> in, in, intrigued to know who that friend is um so uh, again, bearing in mind the circumstances we got at this moment in time, um, what might be the best way to get started? So this is a, uh, if it is the friend I'm thinking of, James, it's, it, it is a, a um, it sounds like horse racing then, doesn't it? it it's, a, it, it's somebody who's new to, so we're just going off here, but James has got a question. Uh, what's the best way to get started, Mokes? Is it like the kind of the stop, start, the walk, run kind of business, or for anybody new to running? And in fact, I've got I've got Ironman athletes who can run a sub three hour Ironman off the bike at the end of an Ironman, and and we do this, which is a walk run strategy. So you know, even if you are at the absolute cutting edge of age group triathlon, going to Hawaii and, and in the mix, we still do a walk run strategy to protect yourself from injury. So uh, if you're if you're fresh to it. I would uh, start off with five minutes walking. I would then jog a minute, walk a minute, jog a minute, walk a minute. Um, I'd do maybe 10 of them because that's then 20 minutes. And then I'd, I'd be home and I'd walk a couple of minutes home. Yeah. If you're not used to running, the muscle soreness from running will paralyze you for days. So you've really got to go easy into it. And especially as people that... That's like some motivational that. talk there. <laughs> <laughs> But I think especially, you know, people who are active, who are clients of yours, AD, you know, they're used to being physically active. But what they're not necessarily used to is the repetitive, eccentric yes. loading of every foot strike. And so their heart and lungs, their motivation and, and their general psychology will allow them to push. But actually their muscles and their ligaments and their tendons aren't ready for what they're able to, to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I would have the, that. The, uh, the, 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 the general fitness is better than a running fitness kind of thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely, isn't it? absolutely. And running clubs are littered with people hobbling. You know, running is one of the most beautiful sports. Uh, I, I miss that I can't do it more, but it's it, it's the most injury prone sport apart from shark wrestling or something. 
So, you know, just be careful. And I would definitely alternate walk runs. Um, and in fact, I'd take the word run out and I'd jog. So walk jogs. Um, yeah. that, that's how I'd start. So always five minutes walk to, to warm up. Certainly that's what I always do when I hit the, certainly the treadmill, um, uh, but also outside. And then alternate a minute jogging, a minute walking. Do that for 20 minutes. Arrive yourself at home. Give yourself a day off. Never run day back-to-back uh, -back days. It's just not worth it. Um, and then gradually see where you are from there. And, um, and if I add my tuppence worth in it, so I think you guys, I know I got back to running this year after about a f five or six year layoff. And um, my, my, my first three runs were all downhill. Um, they were also from one pub to another. Um, but no, they were from the, the, the crown of one hope to the green man. So it's just about making life as easy as you can to start off with, isn't it? It's about what I call sneaking below the radar. So literally you're just tiptoeing your way through and getting it in the bank. And, yeah. and not not trying to be a hero you you never know what you're going to feel like after so um, people think that, that running you've, you've got a you know they're applying the sort of normal exercise psych, um logic to, to running and they think that i have to push myself you know i have to push myself actually just running is pushing yourself if you haven't done it before you're asking your body <laughs> well even if you have <laughs> your weight on every you know what is it 80 footsteps a minute for however many minutes that's a big ask I call them so, shuffles rather than steps. Shuffles rather than steps. I don't believe it. feet don't need to leave the ground. Okay, cool. We got another question. Nick's new. Nick's been with us about, oh, I hate saying this because I get it wrong invariably. Um, I'm going to say seven to eight months now. Made great progress. Um, he's clearly on a mission. Um, so, um, heed the advice of what we've been talking about, Mr. Snook. Um, Luke, um, looking to build to 135 miler um, in three months' time. This is on a bike. Thankfully, um, <laughs> any any advice on training distance progressions? Thanks. So, um, uh, Nick's, I believe, set up a kind of like look into um, visit a more favourite place of his or something like this. I, I put a link to the Audax UK website in, even though there's no Audax is taking place this moment in time. I know. Um, I think another client has hooked you up with a. Um, a blah, 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 a, a turbo trainer this week. So, um, Luke, any kind of. Um, the one thing which amazed me, Luke, um, Mr. Snook, just quickly, when I did this cycling improvement program the first time around, I I did this for 12 weeks from um, January 2014, I think 2015, um, until March when I first went on a cycling trip to Mallorca. And without being too bullshit, amazed from the cycling improvement program that when you do go outside, how far you can go. At a relatively, and I'm talking 50 kind of miles here, about three hours on the bike for three or three or four hours on the bike. Um, so this alone will give you. Um, I think Luke would probably reiterate this: is it's the need to build up your your bike craft, your road craft, isn't it? Your cycling skills and and your confidence. The roads are busy. Luke, what would you say? So absolutely, I think if if you're looking to ride 135 miles, um, it's probably the longest ride you've ever done. So the first thing is you don't need to ride 135 miles in training to ride 135 miles um, on the day. Um, what I would say is there's probably three aspects to your preparation. And um, the first, exactly as AD says, is riding your bike and being relaxed on your bike. You know those bike type skills that allow you to both conserve your momentum round corners, over over rises, etc but also all those comfortable things. And, and I obviously don't know how experienced a cyclist you are, but being able to drink on the move, being able to, to eat out of your back pocket while you know, traffic's around and all that sort of stuff, all your navigation-y type stuff. If you're good at that, not only does it make you quicker because you're moving through the world quicker, it makes you a lot safer and a lot more enjoyable as well. So the first thing is those, those skills. And it's worth almost being a little bit um, overly rational about this and writing down key skills, You know, writing down things like, um, Oh, can I can I drink with my left hand? You know, that sort of stuff. How am I into the wind? Um, so that's the first thing. And um, the second thing, oh, Aidy, you, you, you just paused. You still there? I know I was um, left hand drinking. Left hand drinking. So the second thing <laughs> is, is building up your, your duration. And that was your specific question. How should I go around building up my duration? Um, I would look at duration rather than mileage. Um, it's easy to become sort of overly focused on 100, 135 miles or whatever, but it's much easier to measure 
duration and that, that allows you to, to not worry about things like headwinds or tailwinds or hilly loops or short you know flat loops that sort of stuff so i would look out and if i think you're looking to do 135 miles that's a long day in the saddle you know you do need a couple of long rides just to make sure that your backside's comfortable that your position is good that you know about eating what you can eat you know when you stop at garages and stuff that you're smooth that you're not going up to get into, into shops and browsing for ages you know i'm going in I'm getting this, I'm getting that, I'm out on the door again. Um, so I would plan that you build up on maybe a three to four week cycle. Um, it might be something like three hours this week, three and a half hours next week, four hours, um, a third week, and then back down to two hours so that you've got to kind of build up and then a recovery. And then the following week, if you've done three, three and a half, four, you might do three and a half, four, five, something like that, and then and then recover in that fourth week. Um, and that would be one long ride a week is, is plenty. Um, and generally, other than one big recce ride where you're out for kind of six or seven hours just to make sure that everything works, I don't think you need to be riding really longer than five hours um, and still maintain some kind of balance in your life. Clearly, I don't know, don't know your circumstances. So that would be the second thing. And the third thing would be some intensity. Um, it, it often sounds people seem to be in two kind of um, broad camps of thought. They're those that think I need to ride long. So all I need to do is ride long and slow. And that's fine if you don't have a job um, or you can be a normal person with a job and a family. Um, and then what you need to do is to put some intensity in there. And I talked about the cycle improvement program. That's perfect. That's exactly what I would do um, or some similar structured kind of training sessions. Um, and what they'll do is they'll open up your top end. They will give you the ability to to feel easier at 15 miles an hour. That's what you want. You know, your long rides allow you to go at 15 miles an hour for, 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 for a longer duration. High intensity will allow you to feel easier at 15 miles an hour. So those are my three things. Number one is learn to ride your bike. Uh, I'm sure you could, you know, I'm sure you're capable as well, but we can all improve. And, and I've been riding my bike for 32 years properly in inverted commas, and I still go out and practice techniques. Uh, number number two is, is build up your, your volume uh, on in terms of duration on a week by week basis. And number three is do some hard work on the bike. Turbo trainers are gay. I'll, I'll, obviously, you've got AD's um, fit, uh, cycling improvement program. I'm going to link into other online things that you can uh, that you can I just see. Posted up the um, I just posted up the DC Rainmaker com. Um, so yeah, that's good. Um, Nick, just to, just to add to that, I'd say um, you know great advice. <clears throat> great advice from Luke. So I'm literally saying what Luke's just said, I think, probably. But um, just go out on your bike. Um, don't even look at what speed you're doing and just enjoy it, if I'm honest with you. Um, what, one thing I tend to do now when, we, when I go out cycling is, like, um, phone's in the back pocket on silent. I, I don't have any kind of, like, GPS or data. It's, um, I go out cycling with Robin or Louis and Wayne or Claire or whoever. Uh, and literally, for me, it, it's about... It's about having a break and just really enjoying taking in what's around you in this lovely countryside we've got around us. So, um, um, but obviously you need to be calm to do that first of all. So, um, choose some roads which are uh, quiet roads. You know, um, like everybody, I've made mistakes and gone out. And um, <laughs> Robin will tell you who cycles with me that we did a long road down to Devon and we went on the A38. And it, I remember it as a kid, a, a, yeah, quite a quiet road, not not on a, on a not on a sunny Saturday morning. It isn't. Um, so just it, Make make it easy for yourself, you know. Make it make it um, taking some great scenery, make it interesting for yourself. But Luke said, get the intensity with a cycling improvement program or some of these links in this period of time while the gym's closed, um, and then just build up, build up. But as, again, as Luke said, you don't need to be doing 100 miles every weekend to go and ride 135 miles. Okay, just make sure that your kit is reliable and you're comfortable, um, and get ready for a few sore patches in a few places. <laughs> but that, that, that's just the joy of it, Nick. Honestly. Okay, we've got one final question from Anne. Anne says, um, what if you have a micro fracture in the knee? I have been doing fitness for around a year now with no issues other than a bit of stiffness in the knee. Um, Anne, I'm not sure whether that's relative to cycling or running. My advice to you, Anne, knowing you, would be to make sure that you progress things very, very gradually, okay? Just avoid going and doing any kind of like, any spike in workload um increasing things massively just be very well, that being yeah just ask our advice first on a one-to-one -one basis that would be the best thing there i think okay um i'm not sure what you're planning on going and doing and you've got me thinking now okay so um luke um half an hour has gone as um we could you know i could talk to you all afternoon as you know mate it's really really interesting as always got some great insights 
and some good information for our members. Nick says thanks very much. So, um, Luke, I'd like to thank you. Um, would you be on again? Come again in next week, and maybe we can yeah, yeah, we'll have a thing, we'll maybe. Talk. Have a how, thing about, maybe. how about between now and next week? I'm going to post up a little link, which is some uh, stats from Strava. Now I posted, I got it out. Here we are. So right, this is a good post. This is quality. I've been I've been meaning to put this out in a blog, guys, for ages, and it's it's um. Okay. Can so you explain? So there we go. So that's some of um, the uh, the data from Strava. And, and for those of you who don't know, Strava is like a uh, a fitness tracking app that that's used by. Um, well, millions of people around the world. And, and every time they go out for a run or a ride, they upload their data to the cloud um, using the Strava platform. And because Strava collects such an enormous amount of information on active people, they're able to, to break it down and look at some of the uh, intricacies in the data. The link that I've just posted up is Strava's secret to motivation. And what they did is they um, asked people, have you got a goal for this year? And people either said yes or no. And then they tracked those two groups, the people who did have a goal and the people who didn't have a goal. And what, and they looked at the amount of, of exercise or, or, or activity that they did. Uh, and you won't be surprised to know to see that the data shows super clearly that if you've got a goal, you're more active. Um, and the reason I wanted to post this up today is because I know this is a time when for a lot of people, their goals have maybe evaporated. You know, in this time of change, uh, they had races or events or things or holidays or whatever it was they were looking forward to. Um, I've had exactly the same thing. My wife has had exactly the same thing. And, and it's a real sense of loss, something you've been looking forward to for months and that more than anything, you've been using to feed your mojo. So my message is goals work. Find another goal. You know, it's just an arbitrary thing that you're passionate about. Start to look around, see what out there in September, October, November, what's out there in 2021. Use that to make sure that you use your daily activity. That You get out there and you're fresh and you're healthy and you're active. And it might be, I want to be fit and strong to go to my um, grandson's christening or something. Or it might be, I want to run my first marathon. Whatever it is, have that goal and stay active. So it's another thing, we, another thing from i picked up from you or from each other is you know concentrating on the pro enjoy the process not just the goal um yeah, yeah because the, the the goal can be taken away from you just like that kind of you know yeah. as i said to the, about nick a few minutes ago you've got to you've got to enjoy the, the pro not just the actual not just the game there, so, um, there to give you the motivation for the process and the process is yeah. the actual thing the process is the reason i think Absolutely. Okay, I've just got to get back to Anne quickly. Thanks for that advice, AD. I'm not thinking of running, but want to know that I can carry on doing what I'm doing. And quite simply, over my years of experience, your body will tell you if you're doing the right thing or not over a period of time. Okay, so um, that, that would be my advice there. If, if you're feeling better, um, you're not getting in the knee, um, and you know everything's moving in the right direction. Um, if it's not, your body will soon tell you. I'm sure. Okay, so Luke, thanks again, mate. Much appreciated. Um, hopefully, we get you in for the same time next week. Um, and I'd just like to extend my thanks from um, the clan. Okay, no worries, my pleasure. Thanks, thanks for checking me in. Thanks for Cheers, mate. Bye bye. Yeah.